My name is Kelly Batley. My name is Clay Thompson. My name is Neil Mowney. We are MRHFM, a national firm with 70 attorneys and 11 offices across the U.S. At MRHFM, we exclusively help mesothelioma patients and their families. It's all we do. This is why we are proud to sponsor the Mesothelioma Applied Research Foundation and its work to fund mesothelioma research and provide support services and education for patients and their families. At Bristol Myers Squibb, we believe that a single touch has the power to transform, to help make every day better, fuller, happier, healthier. So we are always working, proving that innovation and compassion work best hand in hand, developing clinical trials that better reflect the communities we serve, ensuring that every breakthrough reaches those who count on them the most. Striving to change the world, starting with a single life. Yours. Novacure, we strive to extend survival in some of the most aggressive forms of cancer through the development and commercialization of our innovative therapy called tumor treating fields. Novacure is pleased to partner again with the Meso Foundation. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on this Meso TV episode. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Travis Groats with us today to talk about peritoneal. Um, Dr. Groats, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself, tell us where you're from and um, what your specialty is. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks for having me on the um, on the board on the uh, conference call here. Um, yeah, so I'm originally from Montana, but I'm now at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Um, and so I am a, a surgical oncologist and I specialize in, um, you know, peritoneal malignancies and, and HIPEC. And so one of those, of course, is uh, mesothelioma. And so I've been very active in the Meso Foundation uh, on the board uh, scientific advisory and then also with our NCCN guidelines for peritoneal mesothelioma. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to do this episode because I've had so many questions since the conference that we had in July um, pertaining to um, the uh, speech that you did while while we were there. Um, so many people uh, really liked that and they had a lot of questions for me afterwards. So I wanted to kind of um, build upon that. So um, I guess we'll just start with if you can kind of describe to me what is peritoneal mesothelioma um, and there are several different uh, cell types. So if you could just touch on those as well. Sure. So um, the way I kind of explain like the, the, the peritoneum is, is that, um, you know, it's kind of like a partially deflated balloon. And like if you punched your fist into that partially deflated balloon and, the, and it kind of wrapped around it, you would have a, a layer of the balloon right on your fist and then you'd have some air and you'd have another layer of, of balloon wall. And so the, the fist is like an organ, so like your heart, or sorry, not your heart, your um, stomach or your intestine. And then the, the balloon wall is like the peritoneum. So there's a layer that wraps around the, we call the viscera, the visceral peritoneum. So that's on the, um, the organ. And then there's another layer that's on the abdominal wall um, of your abdomen. And so that's the other side of the balloon. And so that's kind of how to think of the, the um, peritoneal lining. And so that's really covering all the or organs in your abdomen and pelvis. And that's made up of, um, of mesothelial cells. And so uh, you have another sac like that over your heart. You have another sac like that in your um, lungs. And then even in men and in in their scrotum and testicles, they have another sac of mesothelial cells there too. And so that's why mesothelioma cancer can go in any of those sacs. And of course, the lung is most common, but uh, focusing on the peritoneum, um, that's where it arises. And so... Um, I guess it's yeah, it's just a, a cancer of the lining of of the uh, of the abdomen. Um, 
the incidence of mesothelioma and the peritoneum has been pretty stable. So it's not really related to asbestos a, as much as like the pleura is. And so we're hopefully going to see the the peak of pleural mesothelioma uh, now, and then hopefully now that we've done all the mitigation, our hope is that in the future, uh, pleural will go down. But the peritoneum has been pretty stable for the last 30 years. So it, it's kind of related to other things. Um, so that's just kind of a brief background about peritoneal mesothelioma. Yeah, but to get to your, you. yeah. Your other question was uh, histology, right? The different types? Yeah, so I know that there's several different types. Um, and I have had some conversations recently with some people that have had some of the rarer types. So um, I just spoke with um, a multi-cystic person um, as well as the well-differentiated papillary. So if you could just touch on those because those tend to be even more rare, um, you know, some of the rarest of the rare. So yeah. I wanted people to know about those as well. Right. And, you know, to be totally honest, we're, we're still kind of confused on, on those a little bit there. Um, the, the, the malignant potential, are they a tumor or not, is still kind of controversial. Um, in some regards, they'll act like a tumor in the sense that if you remove them, they can come back. Um, but as far as like, do they spread outside the abdomen and go other places? And do they ever cause people to, to, to die or, or shorten their life? it doesn't seem like that in the um in the multi-cystic and in the papillary so it's kind of a, a local problem um and so there's this we call it unknown malignant potential i mean we, we all recognize that there is some rare instances where where these could it could be a sampling error basically meaning that um let's say um usually it's in young women and usually they're having some kind of pelvic surgery is the common situation um for fertility or for other gynecological issues and they just oh by the way and they found a, a cyst and they removed it and it was the multi-cystic and so the question is always is you know um it, it, does that represent you know if there's other stuff in the abdomen is it all multi-cystic or could there be an area of mesothelioma uh cancer and of course, um, it's hard, you know, in pathologists, um, hard for them always to know. So, so we always worry there's this sampling error that we don't know if for sure. So I think in general, we typically recommend to remove all of it so you can get it out and know what it is for sure. And then I typically just follow people. I always try not to make sure the treatment's not worse than the, than the, the actual disease. So um, we typically don't do um, HIPEC or, you know, systemic chemo or a lot of aggressive treatments unless it's really acting aggressive and keeps coming back and keeps spreading, keeps, you know, then we're concerned it maybe is more acting like a, like a actual mesothelioma. Um, so they're, they're tough for patients and, and tough for even clinicians because it's hard for us to tell people you're, you're, you know, nothing to worry about, but because there's always this in the back of our head, there could be a rare chance that this could um, could be more aggressive. Um, so I don't know if I <laughs> explained that well, but no, absolutely. Um, so as far as when somebody has what we would classify as malignant peritoneal mesothelioma, what do those cell types consist of? Sure. So the, the, there's a three classic, uh, where there's, you know, sarcomatoid at kind of uh, the spectrum, I always explain it, is at the absolute unfortunate worst end of that spectrum of sarcomatoid. And then epithelioid is at the other good end in the sense that they typically do well and, and respond well. Um, and then biphasic really is, is in the middle. And that's kind of what it means. It's got a little bit of both. Um, and, um, and so it's right in the middle of, of those uh, in that three. Um, and then there's, you know, there's some other rare forms that mostly in pleura, like the lymphohistiocytoid. I've honestly, I've never seen that in peritoneal uh, yet. Um, it's only in pleura, but um, it's just super rare. Um, but it's just kind of a different um, rare form. So the main things when we're talking about peritoneal mesothelioma would be those three, epithelioid, biphasic, and sarcomatoid. And when you have certain cell types, um does that determine what your treatment outlook looks like? Does it determine what they can do and what they can't do? Yeah, yeah, we, you know, we, um, they're probably the biggest determinant when you have those three. I would say almost everybody with epithelioid or most people are usually surgical candidates, um, typically. Um, and, and unfortunately, the opposite is true in sarcomatoid. It, it, it's very, very rare to have the sarcomatoid type and, and be a candidate for, for surgery um, in a sense that usually the tumor spread um, pretty extensively um, and it's very aggressive. Um, and so, um, yeah, so they, and then again, biphasic is kind of the middle. We're always trying to figure out if it's going to act more like one or the other, um, but that's, yeah. 
Thank you. And when you have um, epithelioid or, or actually any of them, um, this is something that we were chatting about yesterday because I do get questions about this um, and I hear different answers a lot, but <laughs> when you do surgery, um, you know, what does it look like? Because people are often told that it doesn't show up on scans such as, um, you know, a normal uh, tumor or um, uh, malignancy would. So what does it look like when you, when you are doing surgery? Yeah, it, well, so it can present different ways. Some people will have a mass, like a solid um, mass that you can see on scan, and usually they have a lot of pain associated with that. Um, we, we call that kind of dry mesothelioma where there's no ascites and there's kind of a mass and it's painful. And then the other classic presentation is to have ascites and fluid and, you know, it's, they can't figure out what it's from. It's not from your heart or your kidneys or your liver. And, and they finally figure out it's from mesothelioma. So those are like the classic ways they present, but at least in the operating room, um, it, so it can look anything. It can have fluid. It can um, make masses. It can look really pretty normal. I'm always very, um, you know, humbled by like how I'll think a lining of the abdomen is normal and I send it to the pathologist and they tell me there's there's cancer there. So when we do mesothelioma, typically we remove all the lining um, regardless of what it looks like because I we just I don't trust my eyes to be able to tell, um, you know, what is uh, uh, mesothelioma and what's not. Um, and, you know, we have some, there's an Italian study that kind of compared doing what we call total peritonectomy, removing all of it regardless, and then compared it to more selective. And there did seem to be an improvement in outcomes with the, with the more total. So um, typically when I, when I do the surgery, and most of us do the surgery, we, we strip all the lining um, completely in the abdomen, um, especially over all the, the muscle and, and, and um, you know, some parts of the lining over the, the organs are harder to strip. And so um, that may be a little bit more selective um, so that we don't damage the organs. But, but we try to remove all the um, peritoneum over the, the abdominal wall and, and the diaphragms and the pelvis. And when you do have the malignant peritoneal, um, you know, the surgery is cytoreductive surgery. And then um, generally, HIPAC is used. Can you explain? Explain a little bit about what exactly HIPEC is. Sure. So um, HIPEC is it stands for hyperthermic. It just means heated. Um, intraperitoneal, um, so uh, in the abdomen, and then chemotherapy. So it's kind of a regional concept of where instead of, get, instead of giving chemo into the vein uh, or like someone's port and it gets their whole body. Um, you know, there's this barrier between your, your peritoneal cavity and, and your bloodstream. And so if you give it through the uh, vein, it doesn't get as well to the peritoneum. It gets there, but just not as well. And so we can kind of take advantage of that um, and we can give high doses and concentrations of chemotherapy directly to the abdomen. And again, very little bit of it will cross that barrier and go into the um, bloodstream. So people have less systemic effects and more uh, local effects. And since mesothelioma tends to be confined, especially if you're a surgical candidate, to the abdomen, it makes sense to, to really only treat the area where the tumor is. Um, and so that's why we do the, the, the high pec. Uh, we heat it to um, you know, 42 and a half, which is about 108 degrees Celsius. So that's like a really, really hot, hot tub. Wow. It doesn't meant to burn or scald anybody and it's safe. It's just um, that heat actually, cancer cells um, just with heat are, are susceptible to heat alone. And then it also helps um, the chemo get into the cells because um, you can have the cells sitting in chemo, but if the chemo is not getting in there, um, it's not having an effect. So those are kind of the two rationales of why we use uh, the heated uh, liquid uh, chemotherapy in the abdomen. And I get this question as well. So um, when you do the high pec, uh, my understanding is, is that you do the surgery first. And then while the patient is in the surgical suite, you're actually doing the high pec then it's not something that's done later on. Correct. Um, and yeah, and the reason why is because um, when you do surgery, it often causes scar tissue and, and adhesions. And so um, when before people have surgery, the that peritoneal cavity is, is wide open. And so if you put fluid in there, so again, it's that balloon analogy, you could fill the balloon with a fluid and it'll get all inside the balloon and perfect. Um, after surgery, there's going to be lots of um, bands, if you will, all in that balloon. And so the chemo just can't get into all the little nooks and crannies. And so cancer cells could hide and in, in kind of protect it, if you would, in the scar tissue. 
Um, so that's why typically chemo after surgery doesn't work as well as, as, as in surgery, or even sometimes now people are looking at before surgery um, when the cavity is more wide open. And then after you do um, the, the infusion of the, of the heated um, intraperitoneal, you do drain that off before the person comes out of surgery? Correct. Yeah, it's several liters of fluid, so they'd be really distended. So we drain all that out um, before, um, you know, before we wake up a patient. And then um, you did mention this a little bit, and I wanted to touch on it again, but um, systemic chemotherapy. So do we use that sometimes, um, either before or after the surgery? Um, and if we're using it before, does that sometimes make somebody a better surgical candidate? Yeah, so um, so systemic chemotherapy can work. So even though it doesn't get to the paracetamol as well, it's still, we do see responses. So um, it's not an all or none thing. Um, so it can work. So I think there are some people who have kind of epithelioid type and don't have lots of tumor and are good candidates right to go to surgery and get it all out and don't need chemotherapy. There's some patients with like sarcomatoid or very extensive burden of disease of like biphasic or epithelioid where they're just not gonna, surgery can't get it all out and they really can only get chemotherapy. Then there's kind of the people in the middle with like the biphasics or which is again, that middle one where, um, you know, we're just not sure they're kind of on the border of, of surgery. And so we give sometimes systemic chemo either before or after surgery, depending on um, how it goes. If we give it before, we're trying to make them a better candidate by trying to shrink the tumor so that, like you said, so we can get it all out with surgery. Uh, if we do it after, it's usually that we did surgery and kind of got surprised. There were some high risk features, meaning lots of disease or or some other, um, you know, lymph node that was positive or some other aggressive feature on the pathology that, that made us worried. And we're trying to give chemo after surgery to reduce the risk. So those are kind of different strategies of, of using perioperative chemo. Thank you. That was really good explanation of that. The other thing that I wanted to touch on with you, and this was something that was um, talked about at the conference, um, but the pressurized intraperitoneal. Um, could you describe that for us? And then, you know, tell us a little bit about um, where we stand with that uh, within the United States at this point. Sure. So again, you know, the high pec is, is a liquid, is a fluid. So um, you think about it, your, all your organs are kind of bathed in the liquid. And so, um, but you know, we have to heat it. We have to, um, you know, kind of shake or manipulate the abdomen. Uh, it's usually a longer, um, you know, most um, studies or most protocols are anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes uh, of chemotherapy. Um, so, so those are kind of, that's high pec. When we do PIPEC, um, that's a aerosol, so it's a pressure. So um, it, it like I use, I think of it as like a spray can. It's a aerosolized, um, or like when you do your um, your hairspray, you know, you see that kind of cloud of gas. That's kind of like what's, what's happening is aerosolizing the chemo in the abdomen. So this is usually a laparoscopic procedure where, um, you know, there's not big incisions, just little um, small poke holes, and these little nozzles go in there. And um, it's just different. It's now it's air dynamics versus fluid. So, um, you know, the, the air you can kind of pressurize. So that's how it's getting into the cell is from the pressure. So we're not using heat. We're not um, really manipulating or pushing on the abdomen. Um, and so we actually can use lower concentrations because the pressure seems to drive it so well. Um, and it's usually shorter. It's usually 30 minutes. So it's kind of made more for like something more repeatable that you would do as almost as an alternative to IV chemo, where you could go in and keep repeating. And that's kind of how it started first in Europe for um, other GI cancers usually start off where they would just as a, as a palliative or as a, as a destination therapy, they would do these repeated um, procedures. And over time, they would see responses and, um, and, um, and it was, you know, relatively effective. So um, the, as I explained earlier to you, you know, the, the FDA uh, is the um, Federal Drug Administration uh, here in the US, they monitor and approve um, devices, medical devices, but not surgical procedures or, or techniques. And so when we use HIPEC, we use a pump and a heater that's been approved in the US for use in humans. And then we can use it for high and other things. And we can use it for whatever tumor we think is uh, there's data to support. With PIPEC, 
there's a nozzle and that nozzle has not been approved yet in the US. So it's not available for, for use outside of a clinical trial. When you do a clinical trial, you can get a, what's called an IND, which is an investigation new device. And it's like a, a permit, if you will, from the government saying that you're gonna study this new device to make sure it's safe in humans before the government approves it. So we're in that, appro we're in that approval phase. There's several studies I know uh, at MD, uh, Mayo in Jacksonville, and then also uh, City of Hope that have been using this um, device under under that approval or permit. And for other cancers, and they haven't used it for mesothelioma that I'm aware of yet. Um, and once the device gets approved, then it could be used for mesothelioma or other cancers. Um, but in Europe, we have data that there are people who respond um, to um, to the PIPEC. Um, with peritoneal mesothelioma. So it does seem to be um, promising. Again, it's kind of, I think its initial role will be either for patients who are not surgical candidates. And what the European data shows is that some of those people will, could become surgical candidates after, you know, the PIPEC, um, just like if they respond really well to systemic chemo or immunotherapy or some other treatment, they could become candidates. So I think there's a conversion factor we're hoping for by using either the PIPEC, the chemo, systemic chemo, or immunotherapy. Um, but it's just not, it's only in studies right now. Thank you. So right now, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, sort of again, um, right now in the United States, it's it's in inv investigational studies. However, it is for different cancers. Right now, they're not looking at mesothelioma, peritoneal mesothelioma quite yet but they have done some of the studies in Europe looking at peritoneal mesothelioma. Um, and sometimes um, that was really interesting what you just said. So sometimes even if you're not a surgical candidate, they're using this um, and, and that may actually make you a surgical candidate down the line. Correct. Yep. Ab thank absolutely. You. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. I just wanted to um, clear that up a little bit. <laughs> um, and then I, I did want to ask, um, going back to HIPEC, um, is there a standardization for what type of chemotherapy that you are using um, when you are doing the he heated e intraperitoneal? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to standardize because, again, as, as you know, there's only, you know, four to 600 cases a year of, of peritoneal mesothelioma. So we don't have big, large trials to, to really um, nail out the little details. But I think when you look at the studies that have been done, um, people have shown typically that the platinum drugs like cisplatin or carboplatin um, seem to have the best response um, to um, to uh, and, and used as a HIPEC for mesothelioma. So I think those are the two most commonly used um, uh, chemotherapies. Um, there may be some other you know protocols out there that some people are using, but I, I think those are the two most common and, and have the most data. And as everybody's you know a lot of people are aware, cisplatin is very effective, but um, does have a risk of, of kidney injury. Um, and so uh, there's various things uh, people are doing as strategies to mitigate that risk. Um, and then carboplatin, you don't have that risk of nef uh, kidney injury, um, but it can really um, drop people's counts, um, like their platelets and white cells and stuff like that. So there are some um, some toxicities to, to both of them. So I think, you know, if people already have some kidney um, problems, then a lot of people will use the other drug. And the carboplatin, but if people are young and healthy and have healthy kidneys, um, you know, that's probably the first first choice, I think, amongst most people. And if you have somebody who is a surgical candidate, they have um, the cytoreductive surgery, they have the HIPEC. If they have local recurrence down the line, are they eligible for surgery again? Yeah, typically it's a case-by-case -case, uh, situation, but um, and so it kind of depends on a couple of things, you know, how quickly, right? So, I mean, if it happens right after surgery, um, you either have to assume that either either it was missed at surgery or or it just um, didn't respond to surgery. I mean, essentially just came right back after he moved it. So then trying to remove it again, it probably is going to come right back. Um, so that is a little bit of a harder uh, situation. It, it's, it's more immediate. Um, so typically then we would start off with a different treatment first and, and then and maybe eventually get back to surgery. Um, if it's much later, um, then absolutely. I think um, that shows, again, that, uh, you know, must have just been something microscopic that le left behind. It took a long time for the girl back. And, and so, uh, you know, would, would um, definitely be usually be a surgical candidate. 
And, you know, I get this question sometimes too, um, and I think that's kind of a hard one to answer, but um, as far as radiation therapy goes, it's not something that's used in peritoneal. Um, and can you explain a little bit as to why? Mainly it's a, it's a tolerability uh, issue um, to the other organs. So whenever you're radiating something, there's always a balance between getting a high enough dose to the, to the, to the tumor and, and then um, keeping a low enough dose to the other organs. And each organ has a certain threshold um, that they, it, can, it can tolerate a radiation before there's, there's damage. And so unfortunately the, the, the intestine is, is probably one of the most sensitive um, organs uh, for radiation, meaning there's not a lot of wiggle room for, for the radiation oncologist. And of course, the intestines are all in your abdomen and the peritoneum is all there. So, you know, kind of whole abdominal radiation is um, is rarely used, in, especially in adults. And there are some cases in kids where they are used that, but it's just rarely tolerated. Um, and usually you can't get a, an effective dose to the peritone, uh, to the area um, without harming the, the um, other organs. There might be some unique situations where there's a, a very focal tumor in one area and it's away from bowel. So it's not a never thing, but um, it's just not commonly employed. Like, like you said, it'd have to be kind of a, a particular instance where the radiation oncologist felt that he or she could, could get in a high enough dose to the area and spare healthy organs. The other tissues. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to touch base on um, clinical trials that are out there right now um, that are for peritoneal, that we're looking exclusively at that. Um, I know Dr. Mansfield has one um, at Mayo with you. I just wanted you to um, touch base on, uh, you know, what you know is out there um, and kind of what they look like. Yeah, so it's um, it's very hard to do a trial just for peritoneal mesothelioma. So most things are either you know, pleura and, and they allow uh, peritoneal in there. So it's kind of a mix. Um, and so, I mean, they are similar, but they are different. I think, you know, um, we recognize that there are some differences even bio biologically between uh, pleura and peritoneum. So, so we're always cautious about, you know, um, uh, using the peritoneum or sorry, pleura right to the peritoneum, but in most cases it does, it does translate. So in a way, um, so yeah, we have a study that's, really just for peritoneal mesothelioma. And so it's a large cooperative. So we need lots of uh, places across the US are, are, um, have this active trial so we can get um, as many patients uh, uh, treated on the trial. And it's kind of asking that question uh, that, that, we, that we talked about is chemo and, immu and immunotherapy. Um, we, we know from studies in, in uh, pleura that they're helpful. We don't have that answer exactly in, in uh, peritoneum. And so we're directly asking that question in the peritoneal. And so on that study, patients get um, chemo or uh, chemo and immunotherapy, and then they hopefully will go to surgery. And then we'll hopefully learn more about how that immune system or that chemotherapy and immunotherapy is um, affecting the tumor because we remove it and then we can study um, the, the removed tumor and see, you know, did the immune system attack it and did it work or what are some of the method, me mechanisms that the tumor resisted the immunotherapy. So we're trying to answer a bunch of questions um, that way and, and find out if, if this is, you know, if we should be doing this uh, on all patients or certain patients or um, kind of answer all those questions. And this might be a tough question, and I'm not really sure that it has an answer. It may be on a case-to-case -case basis, but related to that study, um, I have a lot of patients who get in touch with me, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's been thought that maybe it was a GYN malignancy, and so um, they've already undergone some type of surgery uh, before they find out that they actually have peritoneal mesothelioma. Would they be eligible for that trial? Good question. Um, I believe <laughs> I believe it's written down. I have to look back at that. Um, I believe they are, um, as long as there's residual tumor and and uh, and we yeah, I believe they are. Um, so if there's still possibly disease left there, um, they may be a candidate for that study. Correct. Great. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. I myself had that question because I sometimes that's a gray area um, because they don't always know what they're going in for uh, when they take these 
people to surgery, um, you know, they think that it's something else and it turns out to be peritoneal meso. So right. um, I would like to be able to get those people on study um, if they're if they're eligible for it. So do you know if there's anything on the horizon um, for peritoneal meso um, that may be coming into a clinical trial? Well, I think, you know, everybody's really excited about immunotherapy. Um, you know, there's a lot of promise now. We finally have the first effective immunotherapy. You know, we've, it's been around for a long time, for decades. Um, but now um, it's finally effective in a lot of other cancers. And it's um, the mechanism isn't specific to any cancer per se. So the good news is any success or often successes in immunotherapy in general can be translated sometimes to other other cancers. Um, so there's a lot of progress in that regard, just from a general standpoint of our understanding of the immune system and how it interacts. And so, um, yeah, there's there's new immunotherapy um, drugs kind of called the checkpoint inhibitors, which kind of take the brakes off of uh, the immune system and, and hopefully the immune system will attack the tumor. There's, um, you know, kind of some engineering of people's T cells. If we can identify a um, antigen, meaning a marker on the outside of the cancer, like the mesothelioma, that um, the, 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 the T cells, your immune cells could recognize, then we can kind of engineer um, your own cells. Um, um, what's called CAR T cell, where we engineer the T cells, stimulate them, and then, and then give them back. It's a, unfortunately a very labor intensive and cost intensive uh, treatment right now. But, um, you know, over time, those things all go down. I remember when we first talked about Hume, that, you know, they were going to um, do the first human genome. It was going to take like 10 years to try to uh, figure out the first human gene. And then now we can do it in like 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> and so, so that's the hope too, that while CAR T cells is super expensive and cumbersome right now, and really kind of only in trials, at some point it'll be hopefully really cheap and, and then we'd be able to do it, um, especially if it works, um, you do it more, more readily. Yeah, it's pretty amazing where we've come even in the last um, 10 years with the different treatment options that we have available. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, with the with the um, looking at chemotherapy plus immunotherapy, um, because we've seen that work so well in, in other tumor types that, you know, hopefully we're going to see that translate over into the mesothelioma world as well. So, um, but I wanted to say thank you for joining us today. This has been so helpful. Um, and I, I feel like our patients and our caregivers will get a lot of information out of this episode. So thank you so much for, for coming on today with us. We, we greatly appreciate it. Of course. Thank you, Shan. Thanks for thank having me. Thank you. Thank yep. you.